We can look at time as a continuously rising value. The more time passes, the bigger the value gets. If we take a point and feed a time value into one of the coordinates, it will move along that axis with each passing second. A sine function can convert this linear graph into a wave. Likewise, a sine wave fed into the position of a point makes it wobble back and forth. Multiplying the time by some factor can speed it up or slow it down. Feeding the same time value into a cosine function and using it to manipulate another axis results in circular motion. This diagram shows how both values work in conjunction. Let's stop thinking about our point as a moving object. Let's instead treat it like a path that contains all possible locations our point could move to. Check out what happens if I multiply, or speed up, the time for only one of the two axes. Seemingly, our path is now broken. Let's increase the multiplier further. Can you guess what the shape would look like when one number stays at 1 and the other one is 2? As a hint. Imagine our moving point and how it crossed the center of the coordinate system once and went back. What would the path look like if it crossed the center line twice? Let's have a look. And now you can surely guess what it would look like with 3 or 4. You've probably noticed how our path is no longer broken whenever both parts are multiplied by a whole number. If I now increase the other value again until they match, you'll see how it turns into a circle again. But it's faster. Now it circles around four times instead of one. This tells us two things. First of all, playing with the individual multipliers can affect the overall shape, but will also affect the speed of our moving objects. Secondly, if we evenly increase our multipliers, we can change the overall speed without influencing the shape. Let's revisit this configuration. Seemingly our motion path is no longer closed, but if I increase the simulation time, even this set of multipliers at some point lines up in a way that the path repeats itself. Let's now jump into the third dimension and build this in Blender. If you've been able to follow so far, it should be simple. We will start with any geometry. A torus, for example, will do. New geometry node setup, we can disconnect this. Instead, we are looking for a points node. The points node, due to its count input, can uh, help us to create more than one fly later on because it wouldn't be a swarm with just one fly. The combine XYZ helps us to access the individual vector channels and into this goes the scene time. I'm using seconds, you can use frame as well. It's just going to be a lot faster than probably. Here in this math node, I'm putting a sine function and now we have a point that is wobbling back and forth. I'm duplicating the sine function, setting it to cosine and putting it into the y. And now we have circular motion. A duplicate of this math node set to multiply goes in front of the sine and the cosine respectively. And now we have these funny values that help us to change the shape of our path. So um, just to prove it, if I'm putting two here and one here, hey, would you look, we have the figure of eight motion that I showed earlier. Now we've changed the shape, but we've also changed the speed, which becomes apparent once I raise this value or well, even lower it to the negative. We need to find a spot where we can compensate for this speed boost that we gain here. Uh, right now we are working in the individual vector channels right here. So before we split up there, I'm going to put in another multiply node. And if I tamper with that, you can see that I can indeed change the speed without then changing this figure eight shape. So whatever we put in here has to compensate for the speed gain. Uh, first of all, we need access to these values. So I'm going to create these external value nodes. And since both values here seem to play a role in the speed gain, I'm going to add them together. Now we've learned that even negative values can raise the speed. So in a hypothetical situation where I would have minus 20 here and 20 here, the addition of both of these values would be zero. So in order for this calculation to not break, we need the absolute of these two values, which is just a fancy word for saying that negative values will be converted into positive numbers. Let's plug in this result into the multiplier here. And since multiply makes things go faster instead of slower, let's set it to divide. So even if I put in lower values here, like one and one, you can see the speed remains the same. Or even if I put something like 5000 in here, we have compensated successfully. I would like to have yet another multiply node here, because I kind of like the ability to manually change the speed, create a new value node for this. And now we have like an external factor that we can use to adjust the speed. Now let's jump into the third dimension. So our fly doesn't fly this flat. Right here at the combine XYZ, I'm duplicating the multiply and sign with shift control D with the node wrangler to maintain these connections and plug the sign into the Z like that. And it starts immediately going up and down. 
great. Um, and I want another value just to control the z-axis. So let's duplicate one of these and connect that down here. So um, the last thing that we have to do is include this new value into this speed compensation calculation. So just another add node will do um, at the front here, connect this. And also it has to be absolute like that. We are essentially ready. Let's take these four value nodes, move them out here, select everything up until this combine XYZ, hit control G to group it. There's some switch rule here. So let's jump into the side panel and move this. Let's name this speed. This is going to be X, Y, and Z. Now we can tap out of it, see that everything is correct. We don't need these value nodes any longer. And congratulations, we have successfully created our fly path node. Now, how do we turn this into a usable swarm? I've put all of these three values to one. So now we are flying a diagonal circle. If I increase the Z value to six, it will now bounce up and down six times in the time it takes to do one full revolution from the top view. I can still change as previously um, this one to a two, for example, to get a figure of eight. Just this time it's also bouncing up and down. If uh, instead of a one here, I'm putting in a minus one, the fly will now go in the opposite direction. And armed with this knowledge and some random value nodes, we can create a swarm and also actually control it quite nicely. Here I've got a random value. Let me make two duplicates. It's vitally important that they all have like different uh, individual seed values and I'm connecting them to X, Y, and Z. Already our fly now has a very unique and probably never repeating path. And the best part is as soon as I start to increase the point count, we get more individual fly paths. You might make the observation if you scroll back down to frame zero that all of these flies start at exactly the same point and need some time to diverge. However, we can just give them some time by tabbing into the node group and adding another math node here and just adding a high number to the scene time. I don't know, 4,000, whatever. And now it's like we've started this timeline 4,000 seconds in the past. And even at frame zero now, our flies have a random location. And with our previous learnings about the swarm behavior, we can, for example, say, oh, we just want to have the value one here. So they all swarm around in a circle, but have a random path up and down. Or we want to say, oh, we want, for example, a fly swarm that bounces up and down a lot. So we can just increase the Z value randomness like this. You now still have like a surprising amount of control over such a random collection of paths. Another thing that I'd like to do, let's go back to the situation where they all go around in a circle. I don't really like how the center of the circle is the same for all of them. Take a look for a vector math node. Um, and if I play around with this add value, I can change the position, randomize this position with a random value vector, give it yet another unique seed and put this into the vector. And now you can see they all still go in perfect circles just with random positions. We only need to actually put flies onto those points and that couldn't be simpler. I have a plane here with a material I'm going to add a image sequence. Here I have a sequence of four very professionally drawn fly images. They don't have to be very good, they are very small, but as you can see, they are kind of mimicking this fly motion if you look at them from the left to the right. I'm going to select all of them, import image sequence. Now the only thing I have to click is cyclic and auto refresh, so they will fly forever. Put the color into the base color and the alpha into the alpha. I've drawn them with an alpha channel. Now let's jump back into our fly scene and use instances on points, drag in the fly thing here and connect the geometry to the instance. The flies are already going crazy. I will now show you how you can make them always face the camera. So first of all, we need a camera. I've already created one, drag it in here. And I also want the position of all our flies, combine them together with a vector math set to subtract. And now we have a vector from each fly to the camera. This goes into a align Euler to vector node and we are going to use the vector input, not the rotation input, that is important. And lastly, with the rotate instances node, we can connect rotation to rotation and we have to set the align Euler to vector to Z. And now they're all facing the camera, no matter where I fly, <laughs> no pun intended with it. Grab another random vector from here and just feed this into the rotation input like this. Minus pi to plus pi should cover the full 360 degrees of rotation. Now they all face in random directions and go crazy. Mm -hmm.